of the DNA helix uh, compared to disordered DNA or the uh, deoxynucleotides that make up the DNA strands. And it's, in fact, a very useful uh, property because in those days we were very interested in trying to characterize the DNA helix to random coil transition. And the hyperchromic effect made this very easy to do. One could simply observe at the DNA become disordered by the increase in UV uh, absorption. And so uh, Buzz Walton and I decided uh, to get interested in the kinetics of the helix coil transition of DNA. And at about that time, this was in the mid 60s, Don Brothers had produced a very elegant model for, for this, for polymeric, high, high polymer DNA. And the basic idea was that the DNA sub, subjected to a high perturbation of state so that all the base pairs were dis, dissociated, then they had to untwist in order for the strands to, celebrate, to separate. And it was supposed that the DNA untwisted from its ends in a rate that was limited by the viscous resistance to the motion of the chains. Well, at about that time, Ross Inman, who had been a postdoc with Buzz, provided a different perspective. He was looking by electron microscopy at DNA conformations in the middle of the uh, uh, order-disorder transition, so that he was looking in different states, very close uh, to each other in the order-disorder transition region. And what he found was that the DNA didn't simply untwist from its ends, but it opened little loops of, uh, of DNA, of disordered DNA, presumably in regions that had high concentrations of less stable AP base pairs, and these were held together by helices of the more stable GC base pairs. We thought it would be interesting to see if we could measure the rate of untwisting in small of untwisting of small numbers of loops. And I developed a little model that was supposed to predict how the untwisting rate depended on the size and the distribution within the uh, molecule of these loops. And of course, to test this, the best way to do that would be to open as few loops at a time as possible. That means we had to use the smallest perturbation uh, to open, uh, to go from one state within the transition region to another state within the transition. Uh, and, and in fact, that means that, uh, uh, that in fact the smallest perturbation is no perturbation at all. So the question then became, could we measure fluctuations in helix coil content in DNA that was resting in equilibrium? Well, at about that time, there was quite a lot of interest in the possibility of looking at the kinetics of chemical reaction resting in their equilibrium state by looking at fluctuations about equilibrium using dynamic light scattering. Uh, we knew that there was one problem with this, and that was that light scattering is typically not a very good indicator of reaction progress for most reactions. And we knew that we couldn't use that approach to look at helix coil fluctuations. Well, what about hyperchromicity? That's a much more sensitive indicator of relative helix and coil. But even there, we concluded that it wasn't sensitive enough for us to be able to, helix coil, to look at helix coil fluctuations. This was when I first moved to Cornell to take up my first job in the chemistry department there. And when I got there, uh, talking to people about trying to do helix coil fluctuations, people advised me to get in touch with Walt Webb in the applied physics department. That was truly excellent advice. And Walt and I uh, both became interested then in the helix coil fluctuation problem. But we were pondering how could we do this? And while we were thinking about this, I happened to talk to Don Crothers, who told me about his experiments with Breslau uh, to look at the binding of thymium bromide, ethidium, to DNA. And it turns out that when ethidium interpolates into the DNA helix, its fluorescence goes up hugely by a factor of approximately 10. And when we heard about this, we thought, oh, well, that would be a really good tune-up experiment to show that we could measure chemical fluctuations via fluorescence fluctuations, and prepare the way then for doing the helix coil experiments. Doug Magny in Web
FedEx lab took on this project, and although we originally thought that it would be very easy, in fact, it took a long time and a lot of work for Doug finally to show that he could measure binding equilibria, binding kinetics of ethidium to DNA while the system rested in equilibrium. And that is doing that was then the first SES experiment, the first fluorescence correlation spectroscopy experiment. And we've been happy that SES has traveled the world and seems to be a popular technique. Uh, but we couldn't figure out how to use it to look at the DNA even spoil fluctuations. Uh, at about that time, uh, people also became interested in the, uh, uh, in the diffusion of molecules uh, uh, over cell surfaces. And this was the fluid mosaic model of Singer and Nicholson. And what they said was that membrane proteins that are embedded in the fluid bilayer uh, should diffuse rapidly throughout the bilayer. Now, we had noticed uh, that SCS is actually a good way to measure diffusion because you can illuminate a very small region of a cell surface and measure the diffusion of uh, molecules across that surface, which give rise to fluorescence fluctuations, which can then be autocorrelated, and then you get the diffusion coefficient. So we looked at that, and in contrast to what we expected, it turned out that the molecules, the protein molecules that we were looking at, in fact, diffused very slowly. Something was retarding their motion, and of course, the best guess at that time, and still, is that those are interactions with the uh, membrane cortex of the cytoskeleton. And we decided to look more at that ourselves. And although we love to do helix, we love to do uh, diffusion measurements by spontaneous fluctuations about equilibrium, we knew that it would be easier to do it if we developed a uh, perturbation method. And so Daniel Axelrod and uh, uh, Dennis Coppell set up an experiment in which uh, the system, say a cell membrane with a fluorophore on it, was hit by a brief but intense burst of laser light, which bleached out some of the fluorescent molecules in that region. And then over time, we could watch new unbleached molecules diffuse into the region, uh, and from that, calculate their diffusion coefficient. And this was, we called fluorescence photobleaching recovery, Dennis, and then came up with a better acronym. They called it fluorescence recovery after COVID bleaching, so it became FRAP. And now you hear about people frapping things all around the world. Uh, and, uh, and we did a lot of work, and others like Ken Jacobson, Mike Ledden, uh, measured motions of molecules on cell surfaces. And as a result of all that work, there was a favored hypothesis, hypothesis that the underlying cortex form kind of corral structures. This is Professor Kasumi's uh, notion of uh, the picket fence model and hot diffusion. But while we were making these measurements, we also became interested in the cytoskeleton itself, which controls the mechanical properties of the cell. And so we started then to, uh, this is just a uh, FPR, photo leaching measurement. I won't spend any time on that. Uh, we decided to start looking at that more carefully, and I don't really have time to tell you about that, but I'll just mention that when we got started on this, our colleague, uh, Bill McConaughey, devised a number of very useful devices that we and others could use to characterize cell mechanics. For example, Bill invented a device which is a precursor of the atomic force microscope, so that a little probe indented a cell adherent to a substrate, and you can measure the force versus stiffness, the, the force versus indentation, which gives you the stiffness of the cell. These were among his very first measurements, of course, quickly after that, this noise disappeared. And then, there, and then another thing that happened at around a little later than that was that Michael Golodny, an MD PhD student, introduced this tissue engineering so that we were able to make collagen gels with cells embedded in it. And, uh, and uh, Bill McConkey again came to the rescue and devised a system in which we could take these little tissue constructs with cells in them and measure them to determine uh, force versus uh, strain behavior to give us the stiffness uh, of, the, of the conformation. We could also uh, look at the increase in the contractility uh, of, the, of the tissue when myosin was activated in these cells. 
And this is a slide which I really don't have time to tell you about. I'll just quickly mention that we were comparing normal fibroblasts and activated myofibroblasts. And this is a normal fibroblast, which is being stretched. And you see there's almost no increase in force. They're very unstiff, soft, that is. Uh, whereas, uh, or wait, no, that's, that's over here. The, the, the normal fibroblasts uh, have a much lower stiffness than the myofibroblasts. And here we were activating with uh, <coughs> some myosin activator. I can't remember which one. It may have been uh, from or something like that. The normal fibroblasts barely develop any contractile force. The myofibroblasts develop a lot of contractile force. So uh, these are the kinds of measurements that we're still doing. And we've been very lucky to be able to collaborate with Guy Jenna, who's one of those rare people who knows both a lot of mechanics and a lot of biology. And he has been kind enough to uh, provide us with a home after I closed down my lab. And so, um, and so uh, I and other people that I've worked with uh, continue to try to look at these mechanical things. We're looking at how individual cells remodel the collagen matrix. That's work of Teller um, uh, on And then Tony Price, I hope at least some of you saw his poster, is developing a new form of correlation spectroscopy, uh, reflectance correlation spectroscopy, which we hope will be quite useful. Well, uh, I have to stop now. I wish I could go on for another hour and tell you about this work. <laughs> Uh, uh, but, but I do need to say uh, that I'm very grateful to Guy for allowing us to continue to work, and I hope we can continue to work much longer. And also to the many people with whom I work, as you all know, because you do the work, uh, that none of this could have been done without the co-workers who actually did the work. And uh, so I think uh, at that point, oh, there's one thing I forgot to mention, and that is that while we were, while we were uh, developing FCS, uh, Magdi and Webb and I, uh, at Cornell, Rudolf Riedler and, uh, uh, and uh, hmm, I don't know why, uh, Rudolf Riedler and Manfred Eigen developed another form of FCS, uh, something like FCS, and Rudolf then went on to do a huge amount of really interesting work using both fluctuation spectroscopy and other methods. And so I recommend Rudolf Riedler that. But at this point, I really have to stop. <laughs> so I want to thank, sorry, I probably went too long. So I want to uh, thank you and thank the Biophysical Society again.